From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Open Mind. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Open Line. I'm Carrie Sharp. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's topic, we are talking about voting. We just finished the primary here in Tennessee, the general election coming up in November, and how you vote may change because of a ruling by the Tennessee Supreme Court just last week. We're going to be talking about that tonight. And as always, this is Open Line, so we welcome your questions and your comments. I'm sure you have them when it comes to voting, and particularly the absentee voting or the mail-in voting, as you might uh, call it. So give us a call. 615-737-PLUS is the number. I would love to introduce you to our guest tonight. It is Tom Castelli, the legal director of Tennessee's ACLU. Tom, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We just went through a primary which set records for absentee voting, uh, both in Davidson County and really across the state. It was such an amazing turnout when we look compared to the 2012 or 2016 election. Just in Davidson County, absentee voting and mail-in voting uh, and early voting, when you lump it all together, up by, I think, 222 percent, which is pretty crazy. Um, but some changes for the November election. Can you help bring people up to date on what has changed when it comes to absentee voting from the primary and then as we look ahead to November? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think the main, the, well, the difference is kind of what the Supreme Court just ruled in, in the lawsuit. Uh, for the August election, after the order went down from the Davidson County Chancery Court, that opened absentee voting up to anyone that had a fear of uh, contracting COVID, whether they had some kind of underlying health condition or not. And so what's changed is the Supreme Court has now ruled that the uh, that anyone that has this special vulnerability, as the term of the court used, to COVID may vote absentee but uh, people that don't have that special vulnerability are gonna have to vote in person. They're not gonna be eligible for an absentee ballot unless they qualify under one of the other, there's several other reasons people can vote absentee. Like for example, if you're over the age of 60, you can vote absentee by statute. So that stays in place. But if you're 60 or under and you don't qualify for any of the other excuses uh, to absentee vote and you don't have this special vulnerability to COVID, um, then you will not be able to vote absentee like you could for the August 6th election. And do we know what will qualify for having those special vulnerabilities to COVID-19? Who determines that checkoff list? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a question that's kind of up in the air right now, and, and we're hoping to get some clarity from that, uh, look to the state and, and maybe to the courts if need be to get some clarity. I think that the the Supreme Court and the state have both uh, and the and uh, the plaintiffs, those of uh, my clients and the lawyers on my team, look to the CDC guidelines as guide for guidance to that. But that may not be an exhaustive list, so mm -hmm. that's one of the questions that are going to have to be answered. And certainly, things that are included on the guidelines, I think, is a pretty fair bet that those. Uh, those health conditions like hypertension or like um, diabetes, or if you've got an immunocompromising uh, illness mm -hmm. that makes you, you know, where you, you really don't want to be exposed to any type of path, much less the, the COVID-19 virus, you know, those are the things that I think are going to be included under this special vulnerability. And so looking to health professionals to kind of guide us there, I think it's the next step. And caregivers too, for somebody with one of these special vulnerabilities, they would qualify. Yes, yeah, so that's what the court ruled was that there was a there's an excuse in the under the statutes that if you you know not only if you have one but if you're a caregiver for somebody with one of those uh, special vulnerabilities then you would also qualify to vote absentee if you if you want to. Does this put more work on our election commission to confirm that what people are saying is true? Well, and that was a question that came up in the court. The court asked that question, and the answer from the state was that this is kind of, and it's in the court decision, it's kind of on the honor system. I mean, mm. people are going to have to decide whether they qualify. Now, you have to sign these under penalty of perjury, so I don't, you know, people aren't free to just make anything up. Sure. But but um, the state has uh, represented in the in the oral arguments before the court that this is not something that they're going to go behind and try to, you know, investigate and um, and they're not requiring a doctor's note or anything in order to to accompany your application for absentee. So, um, 
so to a certain extent, I think this is going to be up to individual voters to make this decision of do they have one of these special vulnerabilities uh, and, and do they want to vote absentee? Do they feel like that they shouldn't go to the polls because of the pandemic? When I read the press, press release from the Tennessee ACLU um, after the Tennessee Supreme Court released this decision last week, it kind of read like we're happy, but we're not counting this as a 100% victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a, I think, a bittersweet. Um, you know, we set out hoping to have anybody that wanted the option to be able to exercise that option during this this kind of unprecedented elections that are going to happen during the COVID pandemic. And we got part of that. And so it's, you know, that's the nature of being a lawyer. You, you don't always win everything you set out to get. But certainly we, we are we are happy that there are Tennesseans that especially those that are that are vulnerable to the to the uh, disease that have this option wish it had been more expansive but that's kind of you know the nature of the of of any type of lawsuit did this fight just start because of the coronavirus or has there always been a push to i guess um to open up absentee voting uh, i mean i think you've seen it in other states around the country that have vote by mail uh, they, you know, it's not really absentee because it's just an option sure. or no excuse absentee voting um, where anybody that wants to can do it. And, and it's been going on in several states successfully for for several years. So, no, I don't think that this uh, I mean, this particular lawsuit was a, more about the unique circumstances of a pandemic. But the whole concept of whether or not we should be making this an option for everybody is not new that's been that debate has been happening uh, around the country and in the state of tennessee for for several years so did it work well in august I, as far as i know now you know I, I can't i don't have statistics but as far as i know it, it worked well um i think we got first of all we got the results i think yeah. one of the fears was that with all these absent, extra absentee ballots to count that we might be delayed a few days and i don't think i've not heard of of any uh, significant delays and being able to tabulate the results of the election. Um, you know, I think we'll have to see, you know, how many ballots were rejected because people didn't fill them out right or there was some other problem to see whether or not it was a, a true success. But for, you know, from what I'm hearing from, from people I'm talking to, you know, it sounds like it didn't, uh, there wasn't uh, huge problems with the absentee balloting. Um, and and to you know in front of that there didn't seem like there were huge problems with other people trying to get to the polls generally uh, you know during early voting or election day mm -hmm. other than it was nine thousand degrees outside <laughs> so I'm sure that that didn't help but um, but still I mean I, I think you know what we're what we're hearing is that this this worked in this primary and and hopefully it'll work in November and we won't have any problems and everybody who wants to vote will be able to vote. As you've been going back and forth in court, what has been the state's argument? Can you summarize it for me? Um, well, initially, the the state's argument um, in the trial court uh, was that well, really, they, they pointed to several things. One was a fear of of, of increased uh, potential for voter fraud. Mm -hmm. One was, I think, the other main one was the the feasibility, which is really the the dollars, the money that it would cost to. Uh, roll out, you know, this increase in absentee balloting, and that that was what they identified as the state's interest in in not expanding absentee balloting during uh, the the COVID pandemic. Interesting. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. I do want to remind yeah. our viewers that this is open line. This is your chance to call in. Let us know how your experience was during the primary, especially if you chose that mail-in ballot option uh, or any concerns you may have with that. This is the night to ask your questions, get them answered, and let your voice be heard. So the number is on the screen, 615-737-PLUS is the number to call. We're coming right back.